Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I am your host, Trey Lockerbie. And today I have with me author Christopher Leonard on the show. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I am, uh, well, I really enjoyed your book. It's called The Lords of Easy Money. And we're going to get into that discussion around the Fed and how it operates and may and where it might be heading. But uh, you've also written another book, and that was on Charles Koch and Koch Industries. And Charles Koch, we've touched on, we've studied a little bit here on the show, but I'd like to kind of get your take on Charles um, since you did such a deep dive on him, ended up writing this book about him. Uh, it's all very fascinating. So I wanted to start there and just to learn a little bit about, first of all, what led you to want to write a book about Charles Koch? Yeah. It, it, and and the books are actually tied together in interesting ways. I almost consider the Lords of Easy Money as, as part four of Koch Land, which was a three-part book. And what, you know, what drew me to Charles Koch was initially his corporation, Koch Industries, which is the second largest privately held company in America. It's just enormous. I mean, its annual sales were bigger than Goldman Sachs, U.S. Steel and Facebook combined. And it's just a huge company. But what really drew me to it was how, how diversified it is. And it seemed like just sort of a perfect vehicle to explore what has been going on in the American economy over the last 50 years. Because inside Coke Industries, you've got blue collar manufacturing, you've got raw material uh, processing, the fossil fuels industry, you've got very high end financial trading. Coke, you know, it's not very well known, but they've built a financial trading desk that rivals anything on Wall Street. And so that's what drew me to this company in the first place is I just thought it'd be a great way to sort of do a portrait of American capitalism from 1967 to present day. Now, it's hard to say, just judging by what you find on the internet, but it's reported that Charles Cook is estimated to be worth something over $50 billion. He's uh, in his mid 80s now. Give us kind of an overview of where Charles started and how he was able to grow his wealth to over fifty billion uh, in that time frame. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating story. Charles Koch was born in Wichita, Kansas. He was one of four sons, and his dad, Fred Koch, was uh, an entrepreneur, an engineer, and Fred Koch owned this company uh, that was really it, it was a. a and an agglutination of a lot of different firms. He owned ranches, he owned engineering manufacturing facilities, he owned oil refineries. And to be honest, it was kind of a hodgepodge of industrial holdings. And I use the, the, the year 1967 because that was the year Fred Koch passed away. And Charles Koch was 32 years old at that time and had been made president of the family company. And he quickly reshaped it and renamed it as Koch Industries. And, and that's really where this modern company that we have today began. And over 50 years, Charles Koch was CEO of this company and really did have unadulterated control over it and built a, a corporate colossus. And I, I think at the heart of what Charles Koch has done, what was most interesting to me is that this guy is a long-term strategic thinker. And a lot of what I talk about in the book is how he fought vehemently to keep control of the firm. He's kept it private all of these decades. He's plowed 90% uh, or more of the profits back into the company to help it grow. And he's done all of that so he could always keep an eye on long-term strategy, you know, a horizon that's not measured in quarters or even years, but, um, you know, well, over many months, years, or even decades. Talk to us about some of the philosophies that went into growing that business. You, you talk in the book about this thing called this philosophy called market-based management. What is that exactly? And how did that come about? It's such an interesting thing. So, you know, as I said, Charles Koch's always maintained tight control over this corporation. And one of his, I, I mean, I'm just going to call it one of his primary obsessions in life is writing a blueprint for how to manage a corporation, but it really doesn't even go deeper than that. I mean, he feels like I think he's discovered the blueprint for how to run countries, nations, and societies. And it's all 
oriented around sort of free market beliefs, uh, you know, competitive capitalism beliefs. His big um, role models would be Friedrich Hayek, uh, Ludwig von Mises, or von Mises, I always mispronounce that one. These Austrian economists who said that, you know, the best way to organize society is a, a capitalist market um, where, where you, you don't hold on to institutions, but there's this constant wheel of creative, dis, uh, creative destruction that dissolves old institutions and replaces them with new ones. And Charles Koch wanted to kind of codify this free market view into a management manual, right? Like, like the operating manual for Koch Industries. And that's this thing he calls market-based management. And he's been sort of refining this philosophy over the years. And, you know, if you got hired at Koch Industries today, you'd spend the first few days of your employment uh, going through days long seminars on how market based management works. And, and the idea is you're encoding free market laws into corporate management. What does that look like, though, exactly? What would be an example of that, I guess? Yeah. And, and, and it, it begs the question of like, how effective is it? How real is it? Uh, here's, here's what it looks like. Um, let's say I get hired into Coke Industries as a commodities trader in Houston, Texas, okay? And I'm trading oil futures or, or oil supplies. I'm within the market-based management system. I'm seen as something like a small property owner. And I'm given a certain amount of responsibility, a certain amount of money that I can trade every day. And, and it's trying to synthesize a market environment. So if I do well, okay, if, if I'm making good trades, if I've got a good insight into the market, Ideally, I should be gaining more and more authority, more and more responsibility, or within this structure, kind of more property. They, they think of themselves as like property owner with a growing role, you know, more money at my disposal to trade. And, you know, that's one example of, of how this is supposed to work. But it's got this sort of encoded uh, vocabulary. And, and it, it's how these people think. Like, for example, they talk about mental models. Uh, humility and point of view. And these things kind of sound like cliches, but they have strategic and specific uh, meaning inside Coke. Like when I talk about my point of view, I don't just mean like Chris Leonard's thoughts, feelings, and, you know, political ideology. I mean, like, this is my sharp analysis of where I think the market is today. That's my quote, point of view. And I'm going to back it up with a lot of research into the fundamental factors driving the market. And I'm going to develop a view of what the world is like with the, the, the very concrete goal that I'm going to go out into the markets and trade on that point of view, which should be superior to that of my competitors. In other words, I should have a sharper, clearer understanding of how the world works. So you've got all these guys walking around, uh, men and women, I'm sorry, all these guys and gals in, inside Coke Industries walking around using these terms like uh, point of view and mental model. And to me, the biggest effect of this philosophy, you know, while it is effective, I think, um, on, the, on the X's and O's, on, on the tactical reality, it's effective, but it's very powerful, very powerful in creating a common vocabulary and this sense that people inside Coke are rowing the boat in the same direction. And that's really important with a company like this, which is so diversified. You got to have people, you know, in the natural gas unit versus people who make a uh, particle board versus people who are trading commodities all feel like they're part of a, a unified whole. And, and it seems, you know, again, like kind of a cliche, but to have everyone speak in the same language and kind of having the same point of view really helps unify the, the, the team. And I think that that's one of the most powerful things of the whole philosophy. That raises the question around how unique that operating system is to Coke Industries, meaning you would think it's, it's been very successful for that company. It hasn't been adopted anywhere else that you're aware of. That's one of the interesting things. It has not zero outside adoption as far as I've been able to determine. It's not like there's this playbook getting used in different companies. And, and frankly, I think that's something that kind of frustrates Charles Koch. I mean, as you mentioned, he's sort of getting into the twilight of his years. You know, he's working past uh, 20 years past the age when many people retire. And, and you can see he's very focused on, on sort of trying to package and export this this philosophy. He's written 
at least three books, commercially published books about market-based management. But he, he, first of all, it's very difficult to export Coke's secret sauce. I mean, this is a very specific company with very specific uh, capabilities and skills that are difficult to export. Okay, Coke is extremely good at uh, processing raw material, okay? That's kind of what's at the heart of their oil refining, their natural gas production, their nitrogen fertilizer plants, their Georgia Pacific plants. And, and you know, a lot of those skills and mindsets don't export to like a newspaper or a clothing retailer. But also, it's fascinating to me, this dilemma that Charles Koch faces when he writes about it, because, you know, secrecy is key to this corporation. Uh, they get a lot of uh, black eyes in the media for being this sort of opaque and secretive organization. Uh, frankly, a lot of that's true, but it's not just because they're trying to do something nefarious. It's because, you know, the whole key to this company's success is knowing more than your competitors know about markets. So you can trade well, so you can buy and sell other companies well. And, and when that's your major strategy, you don't show your cards, you know, it's, uh, secrecy is strategic. So when Charles Koch tries to write about market-based management, I can read it. I've read all of his books, frankly, several times and interviewed people in the company. You can see how he's got to kind of hold back. He, he can't really talk about what they're doing because it would give away too much of, of, of their information. And so I think that's kind of hobbled his books and maybe slowed down their adoption. You have interviewed quite a few people, especially for this book. I think hundreds of, of employees and people close to Charles. What was your takeaway as far as what were, I guess, some of the traits uh, that you would say created his success over the last 50 years? What are maybe the personality traits or otherwise? You mean for him personally? For him personally, yeah. Um, you know, I don't know. You, This is probably something you hear a lot on your show. Um, relentless and obsessive drive to achieve. And, and that's one of the biggest mysteries to me of, of this guy. It's, you know, he was, he was born quite wealthy. He became sort of um, uh, almost incomprehensibly wealthy. Like you could never spend all the money he makes, but he still shows up at work before the sun is up many times. And, and this is a guy who has been just relentlessly focused on pushing and growing this company to make it as large and successful as possible and to be truly unwavering in that mission. I mean, I, I think that that's the most important thing is, is the internal motivation, direction, and obsession on the work. Uh, that's one of the things that, that hits me most. And then second, and this is a little bit more specific to, to Coke Industries and what they do, it's, it's this thing of having the mind of the engineer. Uh, Charles Koch is uh, almost dispassionate, right? He, he's a nice guy. He's charming. He's folksy. Uh, he, he makes you feel comfortable in a room, but he's not Mr. Go out and get beers with the team and slap you on the back kind of guy. He's analytical and and again, focused with this strategy that's long term. And, and he's really not battered by the ups and downs of markets. And I think that comes from working in the energy industry for so many decades where the, the volatility can just be gut wrenching. And so, you know, for his management style, he's always focused on how this is going to benefit the company over a period of one, two, five, 10 years. And if you come into the office and you've had an absolutely like catastrophic quarter, uh, there's not going to be yelling, slamming fists on the table. It's going to be more of like, okay, is what's going wrong a symptom of a much deeper problem? Or is this a downside in the market? Does this present us an opportunity to buy? And, and so I see this real kind of engineering mindset and a long-term strategy that's, I think, at the core of his success. Given that Charles Koch is now in his you know, mid to late eighties, what would you say his legacy will be? Or, and what do you think he would want his legacy to be? Okay. I mean, I feel like I can answer the latter part pretty easily. I, I think he wants his legacy to be, uh, he, I think he wants to be seen as one of the great business figures of our era. I think he wants to be seen as one of the most successful business people of our era. 
and you know, not to be cheesy, but kind of a philosopher king. Uh, again, the guy has published three books about his own personal history, his management philosophy. I think he wants to be seen as, as a deep thinker in terms of corporate affairs. Um, you know, the, the actual legacy he left behind is going to be complicated by the one topic we've, we've not talked about, which is politics, you know? Um, he really does think he, he understands the blueprint for how society should organize itself. And he hasn't been shy at all in trying to, to make that vision a reality. He's been very politically engaged for decades. And, and that's going to be a key part of the history that's, that's written about him. And, and the thing that really rises to the top on that, this isn't going to surprise any of your guests, I think, is his stance around global warming and around the fossil fuels industry, which is just key to, to Coke Industries' long-term uh, profitability over the decades. He's fought very, very hard against any kind of government regulation to either hinder fossil fuel emissions or put a price on carbon emissions. Um, when the history is written, I think that will be a key part of his legacy. And uh, also, you know, I think within, within the business community, uh, his corporation will will be a case study in corporate management that will probably be looked back upon for, for a long time. Now, you are an investigative journalist. I'm sure part of the appeal of writing about Charles Koch had to do with some of the political aspects that he's involved in. Can you just give us an idea of, you know, maybe an example of him and his uh, controversial way of potentially working within the shadows, because I think it kind of ties potentially to this next subject we're going to talk about around the Fed. Yeah, um, it's just fascinating. I mean, Charles Koch has this like well-known um, saying that the only whale that gets harpooned is the one that comes to the surface. And, and it's kind of a joke in the sense that with his political team, I know I've interviewed folks up and down the, all the levels of his political team. They, they operate below the surface. And this really borrows directly from the corporate playbook I just told about of strategic secrecy. And I, I think Charles Koch has a very detailed, granular view of the machinery of government in the United States. And he's very smart about how to approach that, uh, how, how to hit the pressure points, uh, you know, where there's good opportunities to buy low, sell high, to gain a foothold, to push your agenda. And by that, I mean, you know, getting out into the state government level where you can get a state seat in a state house or state Senate for like $15,000 of, of campaign money. So they've been very smart in taking this kind of 360 degree approach to influencing politics. And, you know, I mean, you asked about a specific story. Uh, they, they pushed very, very hard against the cap and trade bill to control climate emissions back in 2010. And, and they've got an extraordinarily sophisticated network to do that. I mean, they would, you know, I show in the book how they, they, they pay someone to do a study without having Koch's name on it. And then they pay their think tanks to amplify that study and, and go testify in front of Congress about it. And then they, they use material from those congressional hearings to make political ads to target uh, vulnerable senators who are in the way of their uh, agenda. It, it's a pretty complicated machine that all works together and Coke can keep its fingerprints off of it. And it's done, in my mind, a, a remarkably effective job of pushing their agenda on Capitol Hill. Fascinating stuff. Okay. Let's talk about this new book that you've, you've written. It's a topic we talk a lot about on the show, which is the Federal Reserve and its influence. I would say, you know, going back even five, maybe 10 years ago, hardly anyone was really knowledgeable about the Fed, but I feel like it is entering the mainstream now. I think a lot of folks are starting to become aware of their power and influence and how much markets really depend on their every move, uh, even, you know, on Main Street. So I'm kind of curious if, if you had a personal experience with that or, or if what led you to kind of investigate this aspect of the economy? This is how these two things bleed together. Um, one of the things I love about being a reporter is you really you get to meet all kinds of people. I mean, I just love it. I have talked to folks totally across the political spectrum in all walks of life. And 
reporting Coke land put me into contact with some extremely interesting people. And, and there's this one guy I talked to who, who talked to me on background. So I can't like say his name. I'm not trying to be coy or anything. Super brilliant guy. And we talked for 11 hours during our first interview and, you know, five and a half of those hours, he wanted to talk about asset markets. And this was back in the year 2016. And I think that this guy didn't have people to talk to about this and was just sort of happy to have an, an open ear. And he laid out for me what he was seeing in markets and it blew my mind. And one, one headline I'll take from, from what he told me is that, you know, in the first century of its existence, the Federal Reserve printed about a trillion dollars. And, and specifically what we're talking about is it increased the monetary base to about $900 billion. It, the Fed as an institution has one superpower. It can create new dollars out of thin air and no one else can do that. And that's why the Fed is one of the most powerful institutions in the world. And these dollars it creates are new money, high powered money, foundational money that we call the monetary base. So over a century, the Fed boosts the monetary base slowly and incrementally to $900 billion. And then in about three and a half years after the crash of 09, the Fed prints $3.5 trillion. In other words, it does three and a half centuries worth of money creation in about three years. So, wow, what we're talking about now is a step change, a breaking of the graph, a new era in history. And this has had really dramatic side effects in our economy, in our financial system, in our banking system. I mean, this money wasn't a neutral force. It really did change the shape of the American economy. And, and that's what got me obsessed with the Fed in 2016. I mean, I had read a lot about the Fed and its emergency rescue efforts during the crash of 08, but it's what came next. It what, it's what came during the decade of the 2010s that I felt was not written deeply enough about, okay? There wasn't a, a book about quantitative easing or seven years of 0% interest rates. And, and that's the era that really fascinated me. And so that's what this book is about. It starts when this era in my uh, estimation really started, which was November 3rd, 2010. And then it takes us up through the present day after the COVID crash. And, and what you see is a system totally re-engineered by the Federal Reserve. Let's talk about some of the fundamentals around the Federal Reserve, especially yeah. for those who, who haven't studied it. If you go on the Federal Reserve website, it says it's not quote unquote owned by anyone. And it's a decentralized board of governors, essentially from both public and private characteristics is what it says. So talk to us about the makeup of the Fed and how its governance actually works. The Fed is a the result of a bizarre experiment of genetic engineering and government. It's part private enterprise, it's part bank, it's part government agency. And I, I actually, I, I try to walk through this history really briefly in the book, but you know, up until 1913, uh, we really experimented a lot with money. The United States was very resistant to creating a central bank. If you could have a modern industrial capitalist society without a central bank, we would have done it. There's always been this reticence in the US to create something that could be so powerful as a government run central bank. The worry was that it would displace the private market. The problem is we had this sort of wild west of currencies. I mean, literally in, in the late 1800s, there were hundreds of currencies in the United States. So if I went to Oregon and stayed in a hotel, I would present a banknote from Ohio and we would have to argue about the soundness of that currency. This led to an era of financial uh, instability. We had long periods of deflation. We had regular bank panics. And finally, in 1913, we established a central bank with two key jobs. One was to create a national currency called the Federal Reserve Note, otherwise known as the dollar. The second thing the Fed did was it took the role of being the lender of last resort. So if there was a bank panic, the Fed could create new money, lend it to banks that were otherwise sound, that would have been hurt by the panic and stop the panic. 
So that's what the Fed was created to do. And it, it actually did a, a pretty exceptional job along those lines over um, the next century, which we can talk about. But, you know, to your point of who owns it, who runs it, the tensions around uh, the central bank are, are built into the Fed. I mean, it's really a network of 12 regional banks. Uh, it, it, there's no one Federal Reserve Bank. There are these 12 banks around the country um, clustered in a map that really reflects what the world looked like in 1913. There are two banks uh, in Missouri, for example, and only one really out on the West Coast in San Francisco. And the governing structure was supposed to be decentralized, like, uh, you know, to reflect the federal, federalist model of the United States. The regional bank presidents had authority. But then the Fed created this governing body in D.C., okay? This, this is the key headquarters of the Fed. It's in a building uh, on the National Mall called the Eccles Building. The Eccles Building's not a bank. It, it's this home of a board of governors. And, and what we've seen over the decades is that power has really consolidated away from the regional banks and into the Eccles Building, where you've got seven governors who are selected by the president and approved by Congress, who really make these key decisions about how our currency is managed. And now way more than that. I mean, what the book is talking about is how the Fed has become um, uh, incalculably more interventionist than it ever has been in its history and is now doing way more than just setting interest rates. But anyway, those decisions are, are confined now to the Board of Governors, largely in in D.C. And, and the last thing I'll say is that, you know, these governors sit on a very important committee called the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC. It's probably the most powerful body on economic affairs in the United States. Well, the book is called The Lords of Easy Money, How the Federal Reserve Broke the American Economy. And those are very, <laughs> that's a very strong claim. Yes, and sir. I want to talk a lot about that and the roadmap to get there. Tell us the story of Thomas Honig. And let's start there because he had this example. He was trying to, uh, I would say an example of rebellion. He was trying to display post the GFC. And how futile was that? Or how prosperous was that? Did, and, and how much of an impact did, was Thomas able to make? Let's, let's, let's start there. Yes. And, um, you know, let me please hasten to say, you know, lest your listeners think I'm a, a bomb thrower. When I say broke the American economy, um, I, I believe the evidence is overwhelming. The Fed has dramatically widened the gap between the very richest of the rich and everybody else, which destabilizes society. The Fed's actions over the last decade have created um, a lot of fragility and instability in our financial system by stoking asset bubbles in uh, corporate debt, uh, commercial real estate, bonds, uh, stock market, you name it. Um, we're in a real predicament because of that today. And then finally, it has simply encouraged uh, immense amounts of indebtedness in households, corporations, and government. So we have a lot of bills that have yet to be paid because of what's happened over the last decade. So I think a great place to start and talk about this is with this guy named Thomas Honig, who was president of the Kansas City Federal Reserve Bank. And when I got obsessed with quantitative easing, uh, I started researching it and saw that the really pivotal vote that, that started all of this on November 3rd, 2010, was the vote to unleash uh, a new and unprecedented round of money printing or quantitative easing. And the vote was 11 to one. And, and so as a reporter, you're just sort of like, well, that's an interesting number. You know, it's, it's not six to five or uh, three to eight, it's 11 to one. Who was the one? Who, why would someone be the sole person who voted against it? And that's sort of what led me to Thomas Honig, who was the one no vote. And that's really what, what, began the, the core of, of this book, because Thomas Honig has been misremembered by history. He's seen as this sort of uh, cranky dissenter, this sort of Old Testament monetary policy guy who's a, quote, ultra hawk, who is against government intervention, and who voted no for the sake of voting no, and who critically was most worried at all of all about inflation and hyperinflation. And he was proven wrong because we never had price inflation until the year uh, 2021. All of that is wrong. That's what shocked me. 
when, when you go back and read the actual historical record, it, it tells a very different story. And luckily we have access to the internal debates, you know, transcripts of the internal Fed debates are released after a five-year delay. So we can go back and see what people said at the time, both inside and outside the Fed. And Tom Honig was making a very specific argument that, that takes some time to unpack. But what he was saying in 2010 was, if we go down this path, if we decide to become the central force driving economic growth in America, and we decide to do it by keeping interest rates pegged at zero, while pumping $3.5 trillion into the Wall Street system, we're going to do, we're going to create a lot of bad side effects. We're going to create asset bubbles, just like the dot com or housing bubble, that'll make Wall Street very vulnerable to shocks and crashes. We're going to find it impossible to stop printing the money once we start. We're not going to be able to get back out of this plan. And we're going to essentially enrich the very richest of Americans, because the primary way these policies work is by stoking asset prices. And, you know, the top 1% of Americans own 30% of the assets. So this, uh, he called it an allocative effect. We're going to allocate money in America toward the biggest of the big banks and the richest of the rich Americans while creating a lot of instability. And, and this is an argument he made again and again and again. And, and you can see in terms of his dissent, He'd been at the Fed longer than anybody else during this critical period of 2010. He'd been there for 32 years, was never a dissenter. He'd cast two no votes in his entire career. And then in 2010, he casts an unbroken string of eight no votes. Well, that tells you something. He, he threw his entire career on the line to try to stop this policy. And, and he failed entirely, but he knew he was going to fail, I think, toward the end. But he wanted to send a message to the American public to at least let them know that there had been a debate about this. And some people had tried to say no. Hey, I am so excited about this sponsor that we have. The name of the company is Fold. They have a Visa debit card. And here's the card right here. I use this thing literally every single day. Um, every time I swipe it, I get at least 1% back in, in rewards. And the rewards are in Bitcoin. And um, some of the rewards go as high as 100%. There's even a full Bitcoin that you can win. After you swipe the card, you spin this little wheel on their app and then it produces the uh, reward. But the lowest uh, reward you'll get is a 1% uh, reward. The thing I really like about this card is um, you can also on their app buy uh, gift cards. And so Amazon is one of the partners that they have and you can go out and buy an Amazon gift card and you get 5% back when you use this card and so like all your Christmas shopping or whatever it might be that you're doing on Amazon, you're getting 5% back. It's all paid to you in Bitcoin rewards. You can withdraw those Bitcoin rewards to a self-custody wallet, whatever you want to do with it. There's no gimmicks. There's nothing that you're not seeing up front. Um, it's just an amazing uh, company, an amazing platform. And every single swipe, I'm getting Bitcoin. So I love it. Um, if you want to sign up for this thing, and I'm telling you, this thing is this thing is a no brainer. Uh, go to foldapp.com slash TIP. That's foldapp.com slash TIP. You'll get 20% off uh, their spin plus annual fee uh, when you sign up uh, with that link. So go to foldapp.com slash TIP. Well, that debate is especially interesting because you touch on this in the book, how kind of, I mean, cultish it sounds at the Fed, if, if I can say that, meaning that they do not want debate. It's very controversial for to have a no vote, I guess. They want to be seen as this unanimous power that is you know, doing the right thing for society and, and shouldn't be questioned, so to speak. At least that's how I read it in the book. Is that, uh, talk, about, talk about the debates that actually occurred behind doors. You know, you got, you, you got it exactly right. Um, you, uh, you know, you, you could say cult, you could say uh, extreme groupthink. It, it, this really does tell a much bigger story. You know, that, that period I talked about in the 1800s, early 1900s, the politics of, of money and how to manage our currency was, it was a retail political issue. It's stuff people cared about. You know, when, when Williams Jennings Bryan ran for president, he had this famous quote up on the uh, campaign uh, stump where he, he talked about, you know, you shall not uh, crucify mankind on a cross of gold. It was this line that just drew the huge applause. That was a line about money policy. He was talking about monetary policy. 
it, it that all changed, to be honest, when the Fed was created. This started this slow evolution of taking the politics of currency away from the public and putting it into the hands of a very small group of technocrats inside the Fed. And, you know, the thinking behind that wasn't like entirely crazy. The thought was the power of managing currency is so important we can't leave it in the hands of grubby, corrupt politicians. It must be left in the hands of uh, uh, an institution that is insulated from the passions of politics. So that was the idea. But, but what we've really seen definitely accelerated since the Greenspan era began in 1986 was, was that the Fed started to present itself as this sort of Olympian group, this Olympian committee of brilliant PhD economists who are not really even making policy decisions, but who are just solving math equations. That's the sort of the Greenspan mystique uh, that I talk about in the book or, or the Fed speak uh, uh, phenomenon, as they call it. And Fed speak is just to make everything sound so impossibly complicated that anybody hearing it must instantly assume I could never understand monetary policy. Thank God we've got someone like Greenspan, Bernanke, Yellen, or Jay Powell in charge who can understand this. A key part of enforcing this, this view that the Fed is an Olympian group of, of, of brilliant technocrats is to have consensus and unanimity. It's very important that the votes on that committee I mentioned, the FOMC, the votes are almost always unanimous. I mean, it's, it's a big deal when one or two people vote no on, on the FOMC committee. I mean, we see Supreme Court decisions all the time that are five to four, uh, six to three, you name it. At the Fed, it's almost always 12-0, 11-1, 11-1, 10-2 in a wild outlier. This is very much done on purpose. Um, you know, one of the most interesting interviews I did it for the book was with a former Fed governor named Betsy Duke, who's a former uh, Wells Fargo banker, who's who's a Fed governor for many years. And I mean, she just talked very candidly about how those board of governors would meet before the meeting and decide what the vote was going to be, all orchestrated by the chairman at the time, Ben Bernanke. And this is key because the governors always hold seven seats on the voting committee of the FOMC. They always have a majority. You can't vote. You can't beat the governors. It's well known. And so the governors would come into the meeting knowing how they were going to vote. And so at most, you might have one cantankerous regional bank president uh, vote no, but they're always isolated. They're always marginalized. And that's how, how consensus gets built at the Fed. And, and frankly, that's why the the consequences were so significant for Tom Honig to vote no so many times. I mean, I think it's safe to say, you know, uh, I have come to the conclusion that Tom Honig was right and that he made a principled, informed argument in his dissents. Uh, but it's also fair to say he, he largely threw away his reputation through this string of no votes. Uh, he certainly could kiss any job uh, consulting for, you know, Citadel or Blackstone goodbye. I mean, he, he trashed his, his reputation in certain circles on Wall Street, uh, but he felt it was really important to vote no on this and to break the consensus. Well, let's going, well, going back to breaking the American economy, I'd like to kind of understand where you think it started to bend and break. For example, my, my impression is that if we go back to the Greenspan era, there was an opportunity there to raise rates that was avoided or at least ignored for too long, mainly, I think, because of uh, this pressure on Greenspan, either to be a likable guy or to you know, just be amenable to Wall Street. But there seems to have been this missed opportunity, and that's when the bubble started to kind of escalate up the food chain, so to speak. But is that correct in your opinion? Was, does, it, does it go back farther than that? Where do things really start to get squirrely? No, I think you've really put your finger on a very important historical moment with the Greenspan era. I do want to point out that, you know, in the book, I, I talk about the great inflation of the 1970s and, the, and the lots of lessons we can draw from that. 
And that happened. Um, there's there's this fantastic history, a three volume, two thousand page history behind me, like by Alan Meltzer about the Fed, and he just walks through in, in granular detail how during the 1960s, the Fed knew it was keeping rates too low, and it would try to raise rates a little bit to slow down inflation, but then it would face political pressure because the economy was hitting a rocky road, so it would it would uh, lower interest rates again and put more money into the system. And that's what led to the great inflation in the 1970s. The Greenspan era is is critical, okay? It is the foundation of where we are today. And in my mind, uh, one one of the most important policy frameworks that happened during the Greenspan era was this decision to focus only on price inflation. And, and, And what I'm saying here is the Fed felt that it could keep rates low as long as it desired to stoke more lending and hopefully more growth, as long as it never saw consumer prices rise uh, too fast or too hard. And consumer prices, that's everything, you know, bread, gasoline, television sets. At the same time, the Fed and the leadership made a very concentrated, a very concerted decision that they would not worry about asset price inflation or asset bubbles. And if assets were roiling and frothing and there was this irrational exuberance we've heard about, the Fed was not going to step in and and try to stop that. This was a really important policy decision. And it it coincided with a very interesting period in history when we really didn't see price inflation during the 90s, during the 2000s. The Fed, if, if we're being honest, the Fed has no clue why we haven't seen a strong price inflation. Everybody's got their good guess as to why it never happened. But the key is the price inflation is the one thing that could have put the brakes on the Fed's easy money policies. And so you saw Greenspan keep rates too low for too long. It led to the stock market asset bubble, which crashed. The Fed responded with more low rates in the 2000s. It kept rates too low too long in the 2000s, which created the housing asset bubble, which crashed. And that brings us to 09, kind of in the shadow of that massive financial crisis, a huge, huge global crisis. And, And the Fed did a great job of stepping in to stop the bleeding during the financial crisis, which everyone would want it to do. It's what came next. It's what the Fed did during the recovery, during the decade of the 2010s that I argue broke the U.S. economy. That raises this question around the governance of the Fed and how important the actual players are. You know, we could, we could blame Greenspan, we could blame Bernanke, Yellen, now Powell. I mean, but are these people, like how powerful are they truly? Meaning it seems to be, there seems to be this agenda coming from a higher power of some kind, whether it's the president or, or otherwise. And if it wasn't Bernanke doing X, Y, and Z, they would have voted him out and put someone else in. There's a narrative, you know, that this opinion about this. So is this a, is this an error of human judgment or is this an error of higher power policy at play? Okay. I, I think there are a couple things going on. Um, let's look back again to that sort of instructive example of, of the 1960s. Uh, when, when you go back and look at why the Fed kept money too easy for too long in the 60s, it was because, you know, the leaders at the Federal Reserve are humans just like the rest of us. They're reading the newspapers. And, and when unemployment is low, citizens look to their government to do something. And, and we've got, you know, two engines of action uh, on economic affairs. We've got our fiscal authorities, which would be Congress, uh, the White House, the Department of Treasury, fiscal authorities. And then you got your monetary authorities at the Fed. You know, this is a big story to unpack, but definitely since 2009, our fiscal authorities have been on the sidelines, more or less uh, paralyzed by dysfunction not able to take huge action to stimulate economic growth from either a conservative angle of, you know, uh, slashing government, slashing entitlements, slashing regulations, or from a liberal uh, perspective of a kind of new deal where you're directly hiring workers, you're breaking up the big banks. Fiscal authorities have not been able to do anything big on, on either front. And that leaves 
the monetary authorities to kind of step in and act. So yes, this institution is driven by humans and, and they, I think they, well, I know they acutely feel the pressure to do something because they're human beings too. So you've got a political bias, I'd say, toward intervention or, or, or toward exerting pressure. But then, you know, you talk about the, the, the higher power, what, you know, it, it's very interesting that you've got Bernanke, Yellen and Powell, I think essentially all pursuing the same philosophy of monetary policy. And, and when we saw this supposed debate recently about, you know, whom uh, Joe Biden ought to appoint to be chairman of the Fed, uh, Lael Brainerd, a, a Fed governor, or Jay Powell, you know, these two people were, had zero daylight between them on core monetary policy issues. So what's going on? I, I think the best assessment is that easy money policies do not antagonize the most powerful institutions in the United States. And that, that would be the very, very large uh, hedge funds, the very, very large private equity firms, uh, the biggest of the big banks. If you're keeping rates low and you're, 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 you're stimulating uh, financial speculation and debt accrual and, and the sale of debt, you know, the people who you, who you are not going to make mad are uh, Jamie Dimon, uh, you know, the head of Carlyle Group, the Larry Fink, people like this are, are not going to take to the uh, airwaves at CNBC and criticize you. So there's this sort of movement in that direction, I, I think. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to slash interest rates, to peg interest rates at zero. Th the problem is, <laughs> When the asset bubbles you've created inevitably crash, that's where things get heated and, and hectic, and there's a lot of criticism. But uh, you know, amazingly, during crash moments like that, everybody turns to the Fed for yet more easy money policies to help bail everybody out. The Fed is seen as a hero, and uh, the situation repeats again. So, you know, I actually think that there are, are systemic pressures that push the Fed toward easy money policies. A key, you know, the one time you saw somebody break from this was in the early 1980s when Paul Volcker, who was a Wall Street guy, came in and was chairman of the Fed, hiked interest rates from about 10% to 19% and killed inflation, destroyed an asset bubble uh, and, and sort of re-rationalized the monetary system. No one has done that since. I guess my question around the higher power also ties to this example of, you know, going back to, I think, 2015, where Jerome Powell started to take action to raise interest rates. They called it, you know, the result, a, ta a taper tantrum because the markets crashed 20, 25% just from these microscopic interest rate increases. But you had Trump at the time on every, <laughs> every news site available to him screaming at Jerome Powell publicly saying, our rates should be negative. Our rates should be lower. Jerome Powell should be lowering rates. And you know, having the president on all the airwaves demanding lower interest rates, um, and then actually seeing Jerome uh, and actually seeing Powell then lower rates. I mean, I, I was just interested. Interesting to to say, was this a reaction from Jerome Powell of, of political pressure, or was this something that was just made sense economically, mathematically? Well. In, 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 in my view, okay, having reported this, Donald Trump is uncouth, rude, doesn't play by the rules, says whatever he wants, tweets like crazy, goes on TV and says all kinds of crazy things. And people talk about how he, he bullies officials like poor uh, Jeff Sessions, the former, you know, uh, attorney general was just bullied out of a job. Jay Powell wasn't being bullied by Donald Trump. Jay Powell was being bullied by asset prices. Okay, that's what mattered to Jay Powell. That's what got his attention. And that's what ultimately caused him to do exactly what Trump wanted, which was to pivot on tightening, to stop trying to normalize the financial markets, to stop pulling back the Fed's extraordinary stimulus, and to simply cut rates and resume the printing of money through quantitative easing. 
uh, you know, if you really walk through what happened, it, it's such a fascinating history of the Fed trying and failing to normalize between 2015 and 2019. And, and then, uh, you know, leading into the COVID crash. I, I think it's a myth that Jay Powell stood up to Donald Trump or in any way defended the, you know, I mean, that was a, a political theater. The whole thing was political theater. In fact, the Fed had been trying to, quote, normalize. And, and what that means is they wanted to raise interest rates back up to a historically normal level of let's say 3%, you know, when you look back over the last 60 years, three to 4% was seen as, as sort of a normal interest rate. And at the same time, the Fed was trying to draw down the trillions of dollars in cash and excess cash that it had injected into the financial system. And there was a lot of pressure on the Fed to do this. Incidentally, not coincidentally, a lot of this pressure came from Jay Powell, who argued vehemently when he became a governor in 2012 that the Fed needed to pull back. And the reasons are clear. Again, when you push this much money into the banking system, you are stoking asset prices. You are creating asset bubbles. And that would be absolutely fine if you could live in that condition forever. But unfortunately, asset prices almost always converge again with the value of the asset. These bubbles crash. And Jay Powell, when he got to the Fed in 2012, was saying, we have got to draw down these excess cash levels. We've got to raise interest rates or we are going to see a, quote, large and dynamic event. Economists talk for a major crash that we're not going to be able to control. The, the Fed had been trying to do this. They'd been trying to normalize, honestly, since about 2010, when you look at the transcripts, but in a very public way since 2014. And they were not able to do it. You know, the Fed said that during 2016, it was going to raise rates from zero to 1.375%. They couldn't raise any higher than 0.5%. They were never able to truly withdraw the excess cash from the financial system through so-called quantitative tightening. All of this came to a head in late 2018. I don't know if you remember Christmas Eve 2018, there was a stock market crash that was very bizarre because, uh, you know, Christmas Eve is usually a pretty light trading day, but the S&P was down 3% that day. And Powell pivots. Powell pivots in January 2019 and says, we are not going to normalize. We're going to stop raising interest rates. We're going to stop drawing this excess cash out of the banking system. And then by July of 2019, uh, Jay Powell is cutting interest rates in the face of economic growth. The Washington Post reported on this really well. Heather Long, great reporter on the Fed at the time, was pointing out how bizarre it was for the Fed to cut rates as the economy was growing. And, and, and what it shows was the Fed was trapped. Just as Thomas Honig warned they would be the Fed was trapped and had to keep uh, pumping money into the system or else the system would short circuit. Let's talk about one other short circuit you, you describe in the book, which is uh, in this chapter called the invisible bailout. And it talks about the yield curve inverting, the repo market seizing up. Walk us through that scenario. What, what drove us to that, that eventually you know, that sparked the big crash we started to see around the COVID uh, impact in March? That's right. It, it's such a fascinating story. This happened in September of 2019, okay, which in retrospect was sort of as good as things were going to get for a long time. This was a few months before the first COVID case shows up in the United States. And, and the Fed at this time in late 2019 was involved in the struggle I just described. They knew they needed to withdraw the excess cash from Wall Street that they had pumped in through quantitative easing. They knew they needed, needed to raise interest rates slowly but surely up to a level of maybe three to 4%. They never got higher than two and a half percent, by the way, which is historically a very low interest rate. So the Fed was struggling to quote normalize when in September, we saw a banking panic. It's very interesting. Uh, I'm sure your listeners, uh, you know, they're enough in financial markets, they know what the repo market is. But it's a short-term loan market that's really the lifeblood of Wall Street. It's an ultra-safe overnight loan market whereby I, as a big bank, uh, quote, 
loan somebody some treasury bills. They give me the corresponding uh, same amount of cash. And then we flip back really quickly the next day. And I pay a minuscule interest rate for the, for the, you know, the privilege of that loan. The interest rates are so low because a, a repo trade is supposed to be riskless. You know, the, the person loaning the money has hold of these treasury bonds that are the collateral. In, in, in early September, 2019, the repo market seized up. It was shocking. Uh, you know, I interviewed the top officials at the New York Federal Reserve Bank, whose job it was to oversee the repo market. And, uh, you know, Lori Logan, who was over the trading desk, and John Williams, who's president of the New York Fed, and, and the traders who worked for them, talk about being shocked in, in early September when repo rates start to spike. They knew there might be a little bit of increase at this time for various reasons. The short-term market rate jumps from about 2% to 10%, okay? It can't be overstated that these are bank panic numbers. When a repo loan costs 10%, it's a bank panic. What was so strange about this was there was no reason for a bank panic. Um, I liken it to that, that sort of thing we see now in the era of global warming, the so-called sunny day flooding when a town will flood when there's no storm. It, it, it was like, why would we be seeing the repo market seize up when there's no big news on the horizon? Because, you know, back in 08, the repo markets had spiked, but, you know, Bear Stearns had collapsed. It made sense. What was going on and what the Fed understood is that they had taken too much excess cash out of the banking system. They had, quote, quantitatively tightened just a little bit too much and just that little bit too much caused the markets to seize up. And, and we got to remember, there were still tremendous amounts of excess cash at this time, but it, it was too little to keep the system operating. And, and the Fed had to rush in with a bailout. Um, first, they did hundreds of billions of dollars in repo loans, but then they unleashed quantitative easing again, which had once been an emergency program, but is now necessary for daily maintenance of the financial system, the Fed printed $400 billion in a few months to pump cash back into Wall Street. And that brought those repo prices down again. And to me, what's so telling about this story is it shows the Fed was trapped in this money printing cycle just to keep the basic uh, bread and butter, nuts and bolts of Wall Street working just to keep the repo market settled. And, and the reason I call it an invisible bailout is because, you know, the Fed presented this as like a plumbing maneuver, okay? This is what we had to do to keep the system flowing. But really what they were doing, and the book lays out how this works, is they were bailing out hedge funds who had taken on uh, enormous, risky, highly leveraged bets called basis risk trades and, and they got caught short by the repo price increase and they got bailed out by the quantitative easing. And this was standard operating procedure in, in late 2019. And that's before the first COVID case. Now, my understanding is it also opened up swap lines between countries for possibly, I don't know if it's the first time, but it, that, that seems to be a normal thing nowadays as well, where you have these countries that are dollar dependent and they're short on actual dollars and needed the dollars, you know, which keeps, because this is a global effort now. I mean, we're talking a lot about the U.S., but the U.S. impacts the entire world. So when the U.S. repo market seizes up, it has implications across the world. And you had entire countries needing dollars all of a sudden overnight. And so what are the implications of that? Or is that actually a newfound release valve that's actually a, a, a benefit of some kind? Well, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Okay. So the swap lines really open up in March, 2020 when COVID hits. And I, I, I want to point out, you know, there's a great book about COVID called shut down by Adam twos. And, and it really brings to light. This was a historic generational economic catastrophe. There's no getting around that, but we've also got to recognize this was a wave that hit financial markets that were tremendously fragile, priced to perfection and vulnerable to a shock as we just talked about. I mean, the Fed couldn't even raise interest rates. And that's why COVID hitting that market created a financial crisis that was worse than 2008. Uh, and it's amazing what happened in the market for US treasuries uh, in March of 2020. Uh, you know, Financial Times put it well when they said, this analyst said that this wasn't supposed to be possible. The treasury markets literally seized up. The Fed responded 
by executing the entire emergency playbook of 2008, 2009, basically over one weekend. And what I'm saying is all the stuff Ben Bernanke did over about eight months, the Fed did in a weekend. And a huge part of that was the swap lines you just talked about. And, and that's, that's such an interesting part of this whole thing because the swap lines were barely discussed publicly when they first were, were initiated in, in 2008. And, and like you said, they're basically a, a subsidized or guaranteed loan in dollars to foreign central banks that are dollar dependent. So it means that the Fed is expending its, its dollar creation power to help central banks uh, in Europe. And it, it, it was employed to a huge level in 08. And then it sort of quietly died down. And then it was deployed once again, very, very quickly in, in 2020. But even those swap lines were just the beginning of what happened in 2020. I mean, I talked about earlier how the Fed printed 300 years worth of money in a few years. In 2020, the Federal Reserve printed 300 years worth of money in about two months. And they did massive rounds of quantitative easing, which continue to this day. It has become normal operating policy. And the Fed expanded its remit uh, dramatically. I mean, it started directly buying uh, corporate junk debt, for example. It was one of the massive asset bubbles that the Fed had been stoking over the last decade was in corporate debt. The Fed said it was going to directly buy those kinds of loans. And, you know, when the price came due, for the easy money policies of the 2010s, the Fed responded literally by quadrupling down on, on the easy money policies. And so, you know, there was a lot of debate, uh, a lot of controversy over the Fed's balance sheet, which is a reflection of its intervention, how big it is. The Fed's balance sheet hit $4.5 trillion in, in 2014. That was a big deal and had never been that big. You know, now it's hovering near $9 trillion. And uh, a lot of this has been added since March of 2020. So that's where we are today is this sort of quadrupling down on the, on the program. So our co-host Preston just put out a tweet thread that we'll link to in the show notes, but it's a fairly masterful thread that outlines, I think, this sentiment that everyone seems to feel but not truly understand. And what he did is he he basically outlined the top 80% of indices and market weighted them to show that since 2009, the markets were up about 171%. But if you adjust that to, if you adjust it, but if you adjust that for the M2 money supply creation or at least increase, it's only up 6.9% since 2009, 12 years ago, meaning that everyone is hearing that the economy is strong and that real estate is up and jobs are low, or at least they were. And, and, but the middle class is struggling to keep up and meeting my, the best analogy I've come up with is it seems like we are a human body surviving solely on caffeine, right? It, to, at a certain point, it, it breaks down <laughs> without nutrition. So in, in your book, you, you call out this long crash at the end. And, and that's kind of what it feels like. You know, if you're crashing from this caffeine, but it's taking a very long time, you're trying to drink little bits more here and there. What is, what do you see coming next, I guess, as far as the long crash and does it, does it accelerate? Yeah. First of all, I really have to push back at that negative characterization of caffeine. You can survive off of caffeine for a long time. Um, and I'm kidding. So, uh, 12 years, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Um, I fully validate, by the way, the point of view reflected in that tweet thread and exactly what you just said. This is why I wrote the book is I feel like what the Fed has done is, is critical to understanding this very bizarre economy we live in. It is like a funhouse mirror in the sense that uh, asset prices like houses are rising double digit levels and asset prices in the stock market are rising. Corporate debt markets are breaking records right now after they almost collapsed catastrophically in 2020. So you see this froth and ferment at the same time 
our, our, our real economy can only be described as limping sideways. I mean, wages have been flat for decades. Uh, thank goodness they're rising a little bit now, but not fast enough to keep up with the pl- price inflation that we're seeing. Uh, um, you, you know, you can go on and on about the fragility of our supply chain, which has come into direct view, and, and just the falling behind of the, of the middle class. So the, the Fed's policies help describe the mechanics behind this strange environment in which we find ourselves. And so what happens next? You know, the, the long crash I'm talking about, it refers to uh, the idea that after a financial crash, you have very weak growth. And that is exactly what we were seeing in 2010, when quantitative easing really began. And, you know, rather than grow our way out of it, the Fed tried to flood the system with money to stimulate our way out of it. Uh, Ultimately, that program only encouraged stock buybacks, mergers and acquisitions, uh, a run in these debt markets, Uh, didn't do much for the working class. We, we have now doubled down on that again to avoid the catastrophe of these lower asset prices after March of, of 2020. So now the Fed is in a, a real bind. It's like getting squeezed in a vice in the sense that it, it keeps upping the money supply to calm down asset markets and keep asset prices high and, and make it look like everything's normal. And that works fine uh, as, as long as you never have to pay the bill. The, one of the big problems with price inflation is that it can be very destabilizing economically. It's really hard on working class people if wages don't keep up, which they're not doing today. But maybe even more worrisome is the triggering effect that price inflation could have on the Fed. In, in other words, price inflation is right now forcing the Fed's hand they are going to have to tighten much more quickly than they would otherwise want to. This balance sheet of $9 trillion I just talked about, or I think it's $8.8 trillion, uh, uh, right now, you know, if, if you had the job of winding that down, you would want about five to 10 years to do it, okay? You could kind of normalize over five, 10 years. The Fed's not going to have five or 10 years. So what that means is as they raise rates, as they withdraw the excess cash from quantitative easing, we're going to have to face the reality that markets will rationally readjust themselves to a new reality of higher rates and less excess cash on Wall Street. And time and again, we've seen that that reality looks like a retreat from risk assets, a you know a drop in the value of com- uh, collateralized loan obligations, which are built on leveraged loans, uh, and vehicles like that. Another way of putting that is a wrenching downward adjustment in, in asset markets. So that, that's the pressure where the Fed is today is how do you navigate these waters where you're forced to raise rates, but you can't do it without crashing the economy. You end the book by stating that there are a lot of bills yet to be due. We're talking about trillions now, right? Is a crash the worst thing in your opinion? And do you think there's any change in the Fed's policy once they kind of fully lose control of the narrative, especially around inflation? You know, a crash is terrible and uh, terrifying and awful. Um, You know, I'm 46. I've lived through two of these so far, um, two century floods financially, one in 08, one in 2020. It's absolutely brutal. Um, High unemployment is absolutely brutal. And so there's nothing to be celebrated at all about the dilemma that we're in. And there's nothing easy about trying to get out of the position we're in right now. Uh, So, uh, you know, I do think that this, you know, know, hindsight is 2020, but like the Fed should have restrained itself and shown more wisdom starting in 2010. The situation wouldn't be as bad as it is today. But, But that being said, there's no easy way out of this position. And, and to me, you know, as a reporter, one key thing is just that people can, can understand how we got here. At, at the very least, try to work from a common set of facts to kind of understand how we got into this position, uh, as opposed to this idea that, you know, Donald Trump 
bullied the Fed into doing something or, you know, now Joe Biden has ruined the economy. This is a systemic issue that's been building for a decade. And I at least want to understand how we got here. I think it's a great point about it seems to be no longer uh, people shouldn't conflate it with a political issue. I mean, it doesn't seem to matter who's in power. This is, this, like you said, a systemic issue. And yes. my biggest takeaway from this book is what incredible foresight by Tom Honig. I mean, 10 years ago, uh, my goodness. I mean, and, and what a righteous uh, profile you, you, you display in the book to kind of give him I guess more credibility than, or some credibility that he seems to be due. So, fantastic book. I really enjoyed it. Christopher, where can people learn more about you? Where can they find the book and uh, any other resources you want to share before we let you go? Well, if folks are interested, uh, you know, I'm Googleable or ChristopherLeonard.biz is my site, and the, the book will be available in January from all your wonderful booksellers. Well, I really look forward to your next book and uh, following along. Thank you so much again for coming on the show. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. Real pleasure. I hope I didn't talk too much. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.